Clap once if you can hear me. Clap two times if you can hear me. Clap three times if you can hear me. So I learned that from our teachers over the summer. They're all really excellent at getting the students' attention. And having not been an education major, I didn't really study this in school, but it's a really good way to get everyone's attention. So having been the last speaker, obviously I have to get everyone's attention again, and I hope everyone's awake at this point. Before I start, um, I know I look really, really old, but I want to comfort everyone and let you guys know that I am a millennial. So if you guys have your phones out and you're tweeting during the presentation or engaging, I completely understand. Um, if you can, just at PMPUSA is our Twitter handle and hashtag CU Summit. So before I delve in, um, when I was asked to come in and speak to you all today about this idea or concept of going from nothing to something, I think there were two reasons fundamentally for why I was chosen. And the second I'll elaborate more on towards the latter end. But if you hear nothing else and leave here with nothing else today beside this one point, um, I want you to remember that purpose is the nothing that makes you something. Right? Purpose is this really abstract word or a word at the end of the day. Um, but if you can really grasp onto it, um, you'll build something successful. So before I delve into the whole presentation, there were, I wanted to take a second and talk about this idea of passion versus purpose. Right? A lot of times they're used synonymously. I don't think they're the same thing. Um, passion are things that you're interested in, things that you really think you should be enga um, engaged in because they make you happy. Um, and purpose is this step further. And many times you won't know when you're engaged in your purpose until you're years or even months into it. But in finding your purpose, um, I think you need to be engaged in your passion. So find your passions, pick them up. Um, and in the process, if you find your purpose, great. If you don't, move on to the next passion until you find your purpose. I think the power there is so much greater. So in 2010, I set out to solve three very personal problems. First, the number of students who are in un unengaged in inner city environments in elementary and middle school. I had 60 absences in seventh grade just because I didn't feel like going to school. Second, the high school graduation rate at many of these inner city high schools. My high school had a 55% graduation rate. And third was the percentage of students who are college ready by the time they were getting ready to graduate. Less than 20% of the students who graduated from my high school were ready to go to college. And in the process of solving those three very personal problems, we were addressing three problems that are relevant to everyone in this room here today. First, it was the achievement gap. The achievement gap costs our economy anywhere from $325 to $575 billion each year, which is the economic equivalent of a permanent national recession. The achievement gap is the disparity in academic achievement between poor students and their affluent counterparts. The second problem was this thing called the summer learning loss. So research said that this large problem, two thirds of it was actually caused by students forgetting anywhere from two and a half to three and a half months of their learning over the summer. And this specifically took a toll on students living in low income neighborhoods because they didn't have viable summer opportunities. So you're thinking, great, right? Send everyone to summer education. Um, we're, no, we're no longer an agrarian society. Let's get this full year school model going together, right? Well, the third problem was that summer school was broken. It sucked, right? Teachers didn't want to be there, and students didn't want to be there. It was punishment for both of them. And then we were spending anywhere from $1,500 to $3,000 a student, and only had a 60% attendance rate. So we needed a solution. And that's really when practice makes perfect stepped in. But before I go into the model, I want to tell you that I had this really grandiose idea on my way to Cornell. And there I was, um, pitching this idea to anyone and everyone that I met. Literally, when you find something that you're really passionate about, people, would, all they would ask me was, how are you doing today? Or how do you feel? And I'd be like, I'm great, but look, this is what I'm talking about today. It's practice makes perfect. You have to get on board with this. I mean, the real leaders are actually your first followers, or your first followers are actually the real leaders. Right, I'm only up here today because I stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, Amy, Zach, Nick, and Brennan, all of them really early on took an interest in the idea of the 200 different people that I pitched to support, they were the ones who stepped up and said that we want to help out. So, and going through this idea of building a business, I wanted to make sure that there were two really big lessons. Um, and one of them that I want to start with is that the most effective solutions come from the problems that we can empathize with. Right, so let me give you some context. Um, when I reached out to one of my mentors about starting this organization, the first thing that he said was that you can't help the poor if you're one of them. And I'm here to tell you today that, in fact, I think the poor are most equipped to help themselves, right? Because they understand their problems better than anyone else does. 
And so as I was thinking about dropping all my full-time jobs and doing this now, I began to think about the education landscape. Where could I add value as an individual? How is this bigger than just this organization called Practice Makes Perfect? And when I thought about it, the first people who came to mind were people like Arnie Duncan, Wendy Kopp, Diane Ravitch, Michelle Rhee, and not one of them has ever been toured through an inner city public school. And so when you talk about perspective, it almost wasn't there. Now, I don't say that to leave anything negative with any one of them. In fact, many of them are people that I aspire to be like one day. Um, a lot of them are really admirable, and if they didn't take the first steps in education to make that change, we wouldn't be where we are today. So we built this model. Um, we took kids who were academically struggling, paired them with higher achieving mentors from the same inner city neighborhoods because they could relate to the adversity that the kids were facing. They had the same teachers, grew up in the same environment, single parent, low income, whatever it may have been. Um, and then we threw them under the supervision of passionate college students, creating a national teacher development pipeline, um, one that doesn't exist yet, and then took the teacher out of the classroom and brought them back as evaluators and coaches. So there's a lot of pressure today on evaluations and getting teachers to sort of understand the linkage between their teaching skills and student test scores. But when was the last time we gave a teacher an evaluation and asked them to do the evaluation? So they can't build those skill sets if they aren't in those positions. So we build this incredible model. We get a lot of national attention. We're in the New York Times, in USA Today, VentureBeat. Um, Andrew Tisch is actually one of our bigger supporters. Ernst & Young, who also sponsored this conference, stepped up in really big ways really early on um, and helped make this possible. And we're also one of the first nonprofits that are venture capital funded on earned income and not on debt. And so we do all of this really great work. And my, in 2012, get invited to the Clinton Global Initiative University Conference. Um, I, my mom doesn't really understand what I do. She's an Egyptian immigrant. Um, and it's really important that my mom understands what I do because she's the one making the final decision at the end of the day as to like, whether or not I'll get to stay at home. Um, so I get this picture of Bill Clinton, all thanks to Bob Harrison, who's actually the CEO at the Clinton Global Initiative. And I snip it out. There are probably 15 other people in the picture with that. And I'm running home to show my mom, like, this is what I'm doing. You know, you might not understand it, but you got to understand this. And the first thing she does is call my little brother Amir over. And she goes, Amir, in her heavy Egyptian accent, bring me my glasses, please. Come look at your brother Kareem. He's all the way back there. <laughs> my heart drops. <laughs> All of this hard work, and at the end of the day, all you see is my mom saying, you're that far. So obviously the following year, I get really, really excited. I get even closer. We do all this really great work, and now I'm like, here, mom, take this. And I think she begins to understand, right, that we're doing something meaningful. There's something a lot bigger than what, we were, what I had tried to explain to her before. Um, but I don't do it for the accolades. I don't do it for the work there. Um, and in fact, just this last summer, as we were building out the model, I went back home um, two weeks before the summer program began, and I asked my younger brothers what they were doing for the summer. Um, and the typical response, just in, in my household, just like in any other inner city household, was nothing. Um, and I didn't want my brothers to succumb to the same problems that many of the students in my neighborhoods felt. Um, so I said, no, you're actually going to be doing practice makes perfect for the summer, um, whether you like it or not. So um, the one on your left is actually my younger brother. He's a rising third grader, actually just started third grade. And the one on the right just started high school. Um, one of them is going to be at Cornell class of 2021, and the other one's going to be Cornell class of 2026. Um, so hopefully that all pans out. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. You know, a couple more practice makes perfect programs, and we'll get them right on track. But I cheated, right? So my freshman year after college, I went and started interviewing at all of these great internships, right? I'm trying to get an internship, and the first thing everyone tells you is that you need internship experience to get an internship. And then you need work experience to get a job. And so like, where do you start, right? Um, and I have this one guy who I'm interviewing with. And he asked me, what's the secret to any successful business? I'm 14, right? Like, are you serious? I'm there guessing for five minutes. Revenue, net income, people, like the idea. And he says, no, it, <laughs> it's the business model, right? So the secret to any successful business is the business model. Um, it's the processes that inherently make a company good. It's the parts that make a company tick. And if you can define a business model and a set of processes that can be replicated, um, then you can scale a business. And he said, why do you think McDonald's is so successful? It's because they can give a book to anyone anywhere in the United States, and they can operate a successful franchise. So um, Nick, Nick has another year of architecture school. 
Amy goes off to work in consulting at ISG when everyone graduates. Zach, who's one of my co-founders here, goes off to work at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Andre goes to work at the NFL. And here I am at another breaking point, essentially, in the organization's lifespan. Um, every single summer up until this summer, we had done with the intentions of just giving back um, and found ourselves at a point where we can scale the organization or keep it where it's at. So I began to decide about who we're bringing on next, right? And I wanted a true partner. And I had been talking to this guy, Brandon Espinosa, who was actually one of my mentors at Cornell, um, a little bit about what we were doing. He was really passionate and optimistic. And I thought it was really a turning point in the organization's future and decided to bring him on as a partner. Um, and I thought back to this African proverb um, that goes, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. And I think the optimism, the energy that he's brought on board has really helped us continue to expand our work. So like Scott mentioned a little bit earlier, um, there's no such thing as being ready to build something new. Um, if it wasn't new, then yeah, you can get all the skills that you want in the world. People have come up to me before and said, why not spend two years here? Why not spend three years there first? Um, and I had a full-time offer at BlackRock that I could have taken and decided not to when it came time to graduate. And I've spoken to people in every year of the spectrum from 21, where I'm currently at, to 50 with great business ideas. And they all say that they just need that next job to build the network and to get the experience that they're going to put together to launch that next step. Um, and the reality is you're never going to get what you need to all fall in one place to be able to build something that no one's ever seen or done before. So yes, there are things that you could do, like get an education, meet the right people that can help further or exponentiate the work that you're doing, but you'll never have all of the pieces in place to start something new. So I show you this to show you that don't always get too hung up on like the final product, right? Um, when we first came up with the idea, I was going to call it I will learn, dot, 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 because I can, because I was just so passionate about kids being able to learn and the stigma around inner city students. Um, and it is what it is today because I took that original idea and put it on paper, right? If nothing's on paper, you have nothing to work off of. It's always going to be this idea that you just talk about. So when you're ready and serious about something, put it on paper and then work off of that, critique that. You can give it to someone else to look at, um, and then you can move forward from there. So before I close, there's actually a second reason um, for why I think I got selected for this. Um, this is my father and my older brother and a brother who's a year and a half younger. As you can see, the mushroom haircuts were back in the days in the late 90s. Um, so we're all styling right there. Uh, but uh, my father passed away in 2007. He was diagnosed with terminal lymphoma. Um, he was actually an entrepreneur. Um, right before he passed away, we had a small business on 57th Street and 7th Avenue. We sold Egyptian arts and crafts and sterling silver. Um, and I was a salesperson there. And when he passed away, he didn't have any life insurance. Um, so as you all know, you can imagine, if there's nothing left over, then the kids obviously have nothing. Um, and literally felt like overnight, um, there we were from middle class to literally rock bottom. Uh, my mom running to government aid, my brothers and I selling candy on school nights and on weekends to help make sure that we could pay the rent um, because we didn't want to live in the streets. I can't imagine if one of my friends would have come home one day in high school and seen us there, um, just like mentally what it would have meant for me as an individual. Um, but I don't focus on that to say that my father was like a bad person or anything like that. Because, in fact, a lot of the experiences that have come, come through that have made the individual that I am today. Uh, but my father is one of the hardest working people I, I have ever known. Um, he drove a cab for a little while and decided he wanted to start his own thing. And with sales, you know, you're out there and you're waiting for the customers. And when you're working in a city that never sleeps, his theory was that as long as there was someone walking, that they were a potential customer. And there were nights where we didn't close the store until 2, 3 a.m. in the morning. Like, who's going to buy a gift, a New York City souvenir at 2 a.m. in the morning? Um, but that sort of relentless pursuit or desire to succeed um, was ingrained in me in a very early age. And if you remember nothing else from this picture, remember that if you are really passionate and strung up about succeeding, and you can take that relentless desire to move what you want forward, um, that it'll happen. So with that, thank you all for your time, and I'm going to open it up to questions. Thanks, Dan. So yeah, um, let's. Uh, let me, well, I'll just kick it off, and we'll take some questions from the uh, from the audience. But what do you hope that um, Practice Makes Perfect becomes, not only as an organization, but also just uh, inspiring others to to do, you know, to start things like you have? 
Yeah, and no, I think Josh, who isn't, may not be in the room early, um, earlier, said that if you can get a person to believe in something or something, a desire that they want to do something, um, then they can go ahead and learn the coding, whatever else that they need to succeed. And I think we need to do a better job by getting students and individuals to believe um, that they can do something themselves. Um, and I think that's the most powerful thing you can do for anyone. So my goal is to eventually build an organization that exemplifies just that, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you find something and you believe you can do it or someone else can help you believe that you can do it, then you can truly do it. Thanks. Let me see. So um, well, here's a, here's a, a question that, uh, that uh, you know, I think a lot about these days, too, which is how do you think Cornell could further support and encourage you know, student entrepreneurs, whether they're starting for or nonprofit organizations? How can the university get behind them? Yeah, um, I think that amongst other like amongst a bunch of other things, you know, there's there's a lot of support systems out there for mentors, alumni, individuals in there. But um, I think you mentioned someone mentioned it earlier with women entrepreneurs. Um, you got to show more success stories and sort of make this the go-to thing. You know, like make entrepreneurship sexy. I'm not the only student who's been successful doing entrepreneurial things in undergrad. Um, and I think that this is only year two and I'm already up here, so I think Cornell's already taking a big step in getting student entrepreneurs um, to kind of come up and present their work. And hopefully this example is one that other students will sort of take the leap of faith in and start to understand that there's something much bigger than just the McKinsey's and the Goldman's. There are larger problems out there that need to be solved and you need the students attending the most elite universities or even the best colleges around the world to put that education to work as soon as they get out there. Um, the reality is if we don't start doing this work now, then who knows where the world will be in 50 or even 100 years from now. Um, so in terms of support um, from Cornell, continue to increase the classes, continue to bring more guest speakers. The mentorship also needs to continue to be developed. I think there are areas of expertise that certain alumni can come back and offer. Um, I don't know that there, were, there was a lot of like, expertise in the nonprofit industry. Mm -hmm. And just being a nonprofit with like, an earned income model, you realize that it's all one business. But for some reason, a lot of people close them off. Um, and so when we were thinking about different opportunities on campus, we had to be very strategic about who we talk to. Um, so I think there's still a skills or knowledge gap on campus that can obviously be filled. I agree. Uh, great answer. Um, a question about the, uh, the organization itself and how you're scaling it. And also, what's the revenue model? Uh, to keep things sustainable. Yeah, so I mentioned it earlier, but summer education itself costs $1,500 a student, has a 60% attendance rate. We've built value for every individual in the, benef in, the, in the chain itself. And so every participant in our model is actually a beneficiary. And so we're able to derive value in a non-monetary way. And because of that, we're able to run our program at $530 a student. So it's a clear cost savings for schools. The idea is to come in and eventually triple the number of students receiving summer education on the same federal dollar. Let's see, another question here. Um, well, there's a question about what support you need going forward for people in this room to push this organization forward. Yeah, so I actually appreciate that question. Um, <laughs> Kevin earlier joked, he said that people who don't need money don't wear ties, and people who need money usually wear ties. So I made sure to pull my tie up really high today. <laughs> Um, but no, um, we're at an interesting point. We just published our old results, and we're in the process of looking for new school partnerships. I think my background in hotel management and doing my internships at Goldman and BlackRock did me a disservice in building a network in education, and I think I need to continue to facilitate those relationships now. It's something that we're definitely working on. Um, I'm basically doing what Neil did um, with the faxes and emails and letters to people I don't know, but I think would be really interested in the work that we're doing. So. If you sit on a board of a charter school or are involved in a public school, come see us. Happy to talk to you. Well, Kareem, we wanted you to join us today because of your fresh perspective and your energy and also the important things you're doing. And thanks so much for sharing your story. Thank you. Kareem Ibunaga. Okay. <laughs> thanks.